let's dive into Emile's history a little bit. What's the Nancy School? Oh, the Nancy School was a school of an informal school of hypnotists that developed in France in the mid to late uh, 19th century. And the Nancy School was a very interesting school that came to see hypnotism as a therapeutic tool, that you could use hypnotism to uh, help overcome addictions, to help smooth out rough edges of behavior that disrupted uh, relationships or work habits or intimacy. And uh, the Nancy hypnotists were a very interesting group because they probably were the core group that created what we today would call hypnotherapy. Every time somebody goes to a hypnotist to deal with maybe an addiction, smoking or something else, or uses hypnotism as a way of uh, smoothing out or reprogramming old conditioning habits or unlocking things in the subconscious or dealing with repressed memories or even possibly past life experiences, they're drawing upon the legacy of the Nancy school. Uh, you know, France uh, was really, in many regards, the birthplace of, of mesmerism, the precursor to hypnotism. Uh, uh, an occult healer named Franz Anton Mesmer was active in Paris in the uh, late 1770s, and Mesmer uh, had extraordinary insights, was probably in many ways the indirect uh, discoverer of what we today call the subconscious mind. Uh, his theories became very influential. What used to be called a mesmeric trance later came to be called a hypnotic trance. And Mesmer's insights got disrupted because he had to flee Paris due to uh, backlash and scandals. And then the French Revolution came along and, and then the advent of Napoleon and People had other things on their mind than the therapeutic uses of hypnosis, but it was it was it was post uh, Napoleon that the Nancy school emerged, and they kind of picked up the thread that that Mesmer had woven, and they recreated mesmerism into uh, uh, hypnotherapy, hypnosis, and uh, we owe a great deal to them, and that's essentially the. Uh, the thought school from which Emil Coué emerged. Awesome, and and I want I want to dive into kind of an aha moment of Emil Coué. But I love from a self self help. We'll put that in quotes perspective. That Emil signed up for a mail order course in the U.S. on hypnosis in the mid eighteen hundreds. He was signing yeah. up for you know today. Well, not today. Uh, it used to be course. you get cassettes and then it was DVD. Now it's an audio right. download and stuff. But he was signing up for it one hundred and fifty plus, one hundred and seventy years ago. Yeah, he signed up. That's very right. He signed up for a mail order course in hypnosis that was offered by a hypnosis school in the town of Rochester, New York, in upstate New York State. And so here's this man, uh, Kueg, working as a, a druggist, a pharmacist in northwestern France in the town of Troyes. And he gets interested in hypnosis, wants to study it. So what does he do? Writes away to America for a mail order course. That how helped. did he even find that? Word no travels. internet. <laughs> no internet. Word travels. You know, newspaper clippings. You know, you pick up an American newspaper and there's an advertisement. You pick up an American magazine. There's an ad. So he finds his way brilliantly to this mail order hypnosis course offered by a house in Rochester, New York. He becomes interested in hypnosis. Becomes associated with some of the principal figures uh, in the Nancy school, and uh, he becomes a self-help icon, one of the most influential self-help icons of the modern age. Now, you mentioned, thank you for sharing, you mentioned that he was a pharmacist, and he had kind of an aha moment, which actually leads to a Harvard study, like you say, indirectly many years later. That's what right. What did he discover as he's doling out medicine? Uh, Kuwait was working at a pharmacy counter, again, in this little town of Troyes in northwestern France. And by instinct, by instinct, he discovered that when he spoke in favor of a certain medication to his patients, they would seem to do better with it. And so if he dispensed a formula to a given patient uh, and spoke in praise of it, he found that that person would seem to report better results than the person who was just given the formula with no information at all. So flash forward well over a century, and researchers at Harvard Medical School's program in placebo studies 
structure a similar experiment with no nod whatsoever to Kue. They structure an experiment using an active migraine drug. And they wanted to see whether the placebo effect is also at work with active substances as opposed to inert substances. So rather than just giving people a, a sugar pill, so to speak, they gave subjects uh, an active, widely acknowledged migraine drug, and they gave them accurate, positive information about the drug. Then there was a control group who received the same drug with, with no information accompanying it. Sure enough, what they found bore out Kuei's thesis, which is that people who received active uh, uh, positive information about the drug uh, did better with it. They reported better results. So what this tells us is that what we call the placebo response is ever operative. It's going on all the time. It's affecting how all kinds of substances impact us, uh, whether they are inert substances, so-called, or whether they are active psychopharmacological or psychophysical substances. And it's ever operative. It's happening all the time. We could be triggered by any number of things, including packaging, what we hear from our doctor, what we hear from our friends. This was Kuei's exact insight. And it's funny. I wrote to the principal author of the study who would not get back to me. So then I wrote to Ted Kapchuk, who's the director of Harvard's program in placebo studies. And I said, you know, this comports exactly with Kuei's insight. Were you guys thinking of him when you structured the study? And he said, we were not. But I know Kuei, and I agree it could comport with his point of view. So it's fascinating to me that you have this guy working in isolation in, in, at a pharmacy counter in France in the early 20th century who has an insight that it takes clinical science more than a century to validate. And, of course, his name is nowhere in the study, but that's what I'm here for. So I try. <laughs> Emil, he's working for you. On, I'm, I'm working. <laughs> on, on that note, how would you define conscious autosuggestion? Conscious autosuggestion is really waking hypnosis. It is, it is using a mantra, an idea, a visualization, a mental picture to reprogram certain thought groups, thought patterns, subconscious assumptions that we have internalized and that in many regards rule our existence. And sometimes at a certain point in our path, we're able to identify a repeat thought, a repeat pattern that perhaps is limiting us. But identifying that and changing it are two very, very different things. What Kuei felt was that you could institute in your own person the same positive effects that he instituted in his pharmacy patients by repeating mantras to yourself at key times of day. And a lot of people miss this about Kue. It's not just a question of repeating phrases, but he believed, and this has also been validated by neuro research, sleep research, he believed that we enter into a uniquely suggestible frame of mind, really something very much like a hypnotic trance, in those few moments before we fall asleep at night and just as we're waking up in the morning. And this is a very valuable state of mind. Sleep researchers today call it hypnagogia. It's very valuable because we are in a dreamlike hypnotic state, but we retain cognition. So we can direct our attention and you can use a mantra. I just had an amazing time talking with Mitch Horowitz. To see more videos on how thoughts become things, click here, subscribe below.